Let's open tonight's service with hymn number 62 from the hardback hymnal. 62. Let's all stand together. <clears throat> Please be seated. If you'd like to open your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 19, I was going to read our call to worship from a different passage, but after singing that hymn, I thought this would be very appropriate. Revelation 19, beginning in verse 11. And I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war and then our prayer right now the Lord would open the windows of heaven and we would see Christ and look what he says his eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns And he had a name written, which no man knew, but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he tweadeth, treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let's pray.
our merciful Heavenly Father, how we need for you to open the windows of heaven and give to us, through the eyes of faith, the vision that John had of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is faithful and true, the one who is the Word of God, the one who is King of kings and Lord of lords. Oh, that you would be pleased to reveal him to us and that we would find him to be our salvation, our rest, our hope, our satisfaction. Oh, Lord, that that we would be able to have fellowship with Christ in the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray that you would do it for our sakes, for, for, for our salvation's sake, and for his name's sake. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Number 44 from the Gospel Hymns. Let's all stand together. Precious Savior, friend of sinners, we as such to Thee draw near. Let Thy Spirit dwell within us with that love that casts out fear. Matchless Savior, let us know Thee as the Lord our righteousness. treasure. Let thy word here freely flow. Give to us a gracious measure. Tis thyself we long to know. Come and claim us as thy portion. Let us all find rest in thee. Leave us not to notions we would find our hope in thee please be seated that's a good hymn i like the words of that hymn and they are especially appropriate to what i want to try to to speak about tonight and that's knowing christ and being taught of god Lord said that it was um, was the blessing of the Father to teach us of Christ. In Isaiah chapter 28, the Lord asked the question, Whom shall he teach knowledge? Now that's not just, not just intellectual knowledge. It's not just knowledge of doctrine. It's knowledge of Christ. This is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I want to know him. I want to I want to have fellowship with him. I want what we just sang to be my experience. I want that to be for you too. And uh, the Lord asked this question, who does he bring to that place? How do I know if he's brought me to that place? Well, The first answer to that question is that he has revealed to me the error of where I was. He has revealed to me the error of false religion, free will, man-centered religion. Look at the, look at the, um, you see that in verse 9, Isaiah chapter 28, verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand? And that word doctrine is hearing. Whom shall he make to understand 
the hearing, the word of God. And we just read in Revelation 19 that the Lord Jesus Christ is the word of God. And in another place, the Lord said, they shall hear my voice and shall follow after me. And in Matthew chapter 11, the Lord said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent and revealed them unto babes. Even so, it seemed good in thy sight. And then that's where the Lord tells us, come unto me, come unto me, learn of me, learn of me. Whom shall he teach the knowledge of himself to? What did Paul, Paul concludes his whole life was, oh, that I might know him, (laughs) that I might know him. I don't want to be, I don't want to be satisfied with knowing about him. I want to know him. And uh, in verse 7 and 8, he explains the, 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 the horrors of man-made religion. Look what he says. But they also have erred through wine and through strong drink are gone out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. Now he's likening these false prophets to uh, a drunkard. But they're intoxicated not with alcohol. They're intoxicated with a much more damning spirit. Um, and, and look at that. Look at the next verse. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no place clean. Now the the picture here is that you've been invited to a banquet, and when you get to that banquet, you find out everybody is is drunk, and uh, to the point to where they have vomited onto the table. Now, how would you feel at that, so at that place? How long would it take you to get out of that place? And that's what the Lord's likening the, the religion that, that man comes up with, man-made religion. He says it, it, they, they, they've erred in judgment. Uh, they don't judge righteous judgments. They, they've, they've erred in thinking that, that, that man can somehow sway God by his will. They've erred in thinking that God can somehow be manipulated, that God is mutable, that God is less than holy, that God's justice can be satisfied by something that they've erred in judgment. You know, that's, that's the natural man. The natural man comes into this world believing that God is altogether as he is himself. And so whether, whether you've been in false religion or whether you've grown up under the gospel, the natural bent of the natural man is to believe that, that I can bring something. I, I can do something. to, to and, and the Lord says they've erred in judgment. Now, I... I haven't been to a false church in years. <laughs> and, and, but I can imagine that if I went, this is how I would feel. Um, I, I would feel like I was at a, at a banquet where everybody was drunk and sick and throwing up. And, uh, and, and I mean, I know enough about where I came from to know that's what it was. And... Um, what a, what a terrible thing it is to err in judgment. It's, it's disgusting. <laughs> and that's what false religion is to the believer, to the one who has been in the garden, the one who has tasted of the heavenly gift, the one who has tasted of Christ, the one who has who has feasted on his body and on his blood, the one who has smelt the sweet smell of his grace 
in uh, the Garden of Spices, as it's described in the Song of Solomon. Um, once you once you experience Christ, you go to one of these places and look at the foolishness and listen to the stuff that they espouse, and it's like it's like going to a banquet where everyone's drunk, intoxicated, and throwing up on the table. And it's, it's, it's disgusting. You can't get out of there quick enough. They've erred in vision. <laughs> in other words... When it's sort of like when the, the Pharisees and the scribes were trying to uh, trap the Lord. How foolish that is. But here they were trying to catch God on his own word. And they brought up the scenario, you remember, of the man who died and left his wife to his brother. And then he died and the wife went to the next brother. And seven, seven brothers had this same wife. And uh, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? And what did the Lord say? He said, you do err. You err. You don't understand the scriptures, nor the power of God. Now, that's how I know that Christ has revealed himself to me. One of the reasons is that I see, I, I, I see the difference between that which is holy in the Lord Jesus Christ and that which is profane. And uh, the Lord has exposed the false prophets for what they are. And he's exposed my idols for what they were. And uh, it's nothing but vomit on a table. It's, it's disgusting. It's sickening. Don't want any part of it. Um, what, did those, what did those Pharisees do? They were interpreting the spiritual by the physical. Whose wife will she be in the resurrection? And the Lord said, you're, you're taking that which is in the physical realm and trying to translate it into the spiritual. And that's exactly what men do when they, when they misinterpret the word of God. They take that which is spiritual and they try to interpret it in light of that which is physical. They, they, they take the, 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 the truth of, of God's sovereign election and they try to fit it into man's free will and concoct some sort of, uh, uh, some sort of uh, compromise where, where man can still have his will and God can still be God. And, and it's, it's, it's foolishness. They, they, they err in the scriptures they'll take a passage of scripture whosoever will as they said there god god wills god's not willing that any should perish and they 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 pull out different parts of the word of god don't they and um, and they they twist the scriptures and pervert the gospel look at the last part of verse seven they err in vision and they stumble in judgment. Been there? What you saw and what you thought was true, you come to realize in seeing Christ now that it wasn't true. That you erred in judgment and you were, you were at that feast. You were at that feast. And you were vomiting on the table just like everybody else. And you were part of it. And didn't say anything wrong with it. Can't go there now, can you? Can't be a part of that now, can you? <laughs> You've seen the sweetness of Christ. You can't, you cannot go back and be a part of that. When the Lord said, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, you, 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 you came out. And you don't have any interest whatsoever in going back. Why? Because you've seen Christ. And you've seen what that does to his glory. You've seen how it robs him of his glory. And you don't want any part of it. You've been able by the Spirit of God to judge the spirits. And you know which ones of them are of God and which ones aren't. All right. 
So that's the that's where we that's where we came from. We've um, we, we've all come from that uh, from that table, which is full of vomit and filthiness. And uh, we were all intoxicated with uh, with the false spirit of of our own wills and our own misjudgments and uh, our own perverting of the word of God. And now who's going to be taught of the Lord? Who's going to be taught of God? Look at verse nine. Whom shall he teach knowledge? The knowledge of God. Who's going to know God? The only one who's going to know him is those that he teaches. They shall be all taught of God. The Lord teaches you about himself. Then, uh, and here's, here's who he says he teaches. Whom shall he make to understand the hearing? You know, the gospels, the gospels audibly preach to people who don't understand. They don't hear it. It goes in one ear and out the other. It goes over their head. They, they, have, no, they have no ability to, to receive it. Who, and who's the Lord going to give a hearing to? Who's he going to give ears to hear? Well, look at, look at, he answers that question. Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Now, the picture here is a suckling child who has just received his fill from his mother's breast. And what does that child do? He just he lays right there, doesn't he? He's satisfied. He's full. He's at rest. And he's still a child, completely dependent upon the mother. Here's what the Lord's saying. He's saying, first of all, you've got to be a child. Lest you become as a little child, you should not do the kingdom of heaven. Um, the, you know, Father, thank thee. Look, turn with me to Romans chapter 11. Let's look at that verse. Of, uh, Matthew chapter 11, I'm sorry. Matthew chapter 11. Look at verse 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent and revealed them unto babes, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. God gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud. What's more humble than a suckling child who has just been drawn from the breast? What's more humble? A child that's full, a child that's being cared for by its mother. What's more dependent? (laughs) What's more tender than that union that that baby has with its mother? Here's the here's the picture. Father, I thank thee. You've hid these things from the 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 self-righteous, the proud, the arrogant the, 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 the pseudo-intellectual, the one who thinks he's got it all figured out? Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? Turn to me to first... Um, well, let's, let's, you right there. Let's finish this. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Now, how does the Son reveal the Father? How does he do it? He reveals the Father by revealing himself. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So the Lord Jesus Christ reveals himself, and in seeing Christ, we we see God. That's why he says, come unto me. 
Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Now, there's a whole lot of folks laboring. Laboring in self-righteous, free will, works religion. Laboring, trying to get themselves right with God. But they've not labored to the point to where they're heavy laden yet. To be heavy laden means that you've got a weight on your shoulders that you can't carry. They're still, they, they still can carry what they've got. Why? Because the weight of sin's not been put upon them. So here's the Lord saying, all ye that labor, you're laboring trying to remove the burden of guilt and sin, and you're heavy laden. You see, you've got to be both. You've got, you got to be laboring and be heavy laden at the same time. And, uh, and what's the Lord say? Come unto me. Come unto me. Take my yoke. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me, upon you, and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Oh, what a glorious promise. Turn to me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he give the ability to hear the word of God? Here the Lord's already said he's going he's to teach the babies. <laughs> he's going to teach the babies. Suffer the little children to come unto me. For such is the kingdom of God. What's more dependent? What's weaker than a suckling child. It's just been weaned from the breast. Look at verse 18 of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. Men pride themselves in their wisdom. They pride themselves in their knowledge. They pride themselves in their ability. And the Lord's saying, who teaches? Who's taught of God? Who knows God? Not the one who's wise in his own sight. The child has been weaned from the breast. Therefore, let no man glory in man, for all things are yours. They're not yours because you've achieved them. They're not yours because you've earned them. They're yours because you, because you belong to God. And the all things belong to him. So everything, everything's yours. Everything in the world. You, you, know, you can say to the world, you can't give me anything because it's all been, it all belongs to me anyway. It belongs to my father. <laughs> and you can't take anything away from me because I ain't got nothing. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, the world doesn't understand that. Let the wise man, let the worldly man glory in his wisdom and in his abilities. Who's taught of God? Go back with me to our text. Who's God taught? The child. The child. Weaned from the breast. The child that has just received its full. Who is satisfied. Are you satisfied? Satisfied with Christ? Satisfied with His righteousness as your righteousness? You, I mean, you're just completely satisfied. You don't have to. Add, you don't have to add. Try to add anything to what He's already done. He is the end of the law for righteousness to you. You, you you're like that suckling child. I can. I, you're like John. John, here's a picture of John the Apostle who laid his head on the Lord's breast. He, here, what a glorious picture. He's, just, he's at rest and he's satisfied. He's satisfied with Christ. Satisfied with what he accomplished in putting away your sin. 
You don't have to try to atone for your sin. I mentioned this Sunday. The more I, the more I see people, the more I know myself, and the more I learn of people and watch the world, the more convinced I am that we just go about trying to atone for our own sins. How foolish it is. But if I'm taught of God, I'm satisfied. I know that the Father said, when I see the blood... I'll pass by you and I'll be satisfied with his blood. And, and, and I'm satisfied with what God satisfied. Aren't you? Aren't you? The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is the only thing that God looks to for the atonement of our sins. It's the only sacrifice that God satisfied with here. This child is satisfied. You, 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 You know what the Lord said to that woman at the well? You drink from this well, you're going to thirst again. You're not going to ever be satisfied with things of this world. Now, you know that's true, don't you? You're not satisfied with this world, are you? (laughs) There's something in your flesh that, oh, it's constantly wanting more, isn't it? (laughs) What J.C. Penney, they asked him one time, what's enough? He said, a little bit more than what I got. Isn't that way we are? Just, Just a little bit more, I'll be satisfied. You're never going to be satisfied with this world. You're never going to have enough. But we're satisfied with Christ, aren't we? Satisfied with that well. He said, if you drink from the well of living water, you'll never thirst. You won't have to go anywhere else. To find your acceptance with God other than Lord Jesus Christ. You, you, you're like, a, you're like a, a child weaned from the breast. You're, just, you're full and satisfied. <laughs> you're, you're right there with Christ. And you know that his shed blood has put away your sins. And you know that he is your righteous advocate. With the Father. That he stands and intercedes on your behalf. And presents himself. As your righteousness before God. You're satisfied with that aren't you? You're not looking anywhere else. You're not trying to go anywhere else. You're, you're satisfied with his holiness. <laughs> you, you, you realize I, I can't add to my holiness. My, I, I'm satisfied With Christ being my holiness. I'm satisfied with him being my wisdom. God has made him to be my wisdom, my righteousness, my sanctification, and my redemption. And I'm satisfied with him in all those areas. He's redeemed me. He sanctified me. All the wisdom that I need. I find in the one who is faithful and true. Isn't that your experience? Have you been taught of God? Well, you still run around trying to find wisdom and sanctification and redemption and, and, and justification and righteousness somewhere other than Christ. Or are you just drinking from that one well? <laughs> I, I, that's, that's the only well I can go to. And then, so there's three things about this suckling child. Number one, he's a child. Number two, he's satisfied. And number three, you mothers know, what does a child do as soon as it's gotten its full? What's an infant do, a baby do? Goes right to sleep, doesn't he? (laughs) Goes right to sleep. He's resting. He's resting. Who has the Lord taught knowledge to? The child who's satisfied with Christ and resting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4. Let us, verse 1, let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Now he's likening the believer to that Israelite who never entered into the promised land. 
They died in the wilderness because they didn't believe God. They drank from the rock. They ate the manna. They knew the ways of, they knew the, the acts of God, but they didn't know his ways. They didn't know Christ. They received the blessings that God gave to Israel, but they, uh, they remained in unbelief. And the Lord saying, let us be afraid. Afraid of what? Afraid of ourselves. Afraid of standing in the presence of God without an advocate. Let us therefore fear, lest we should fall and not rest and not enter into the promised land. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. They didn't believe God. Oh, Lord, give me faith. Give me faith and help my unbelief. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. I love that, don't you? What great rest. The works were finished. From the foundation of the world. The Lord Jesus Christ is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. In other words, what God's saying is the hope of your rest is founded in the covenant of grace established by God with God before time ever began. What's that have to do with you? (laughs) Nothing. I can rest there. I can rest in a promise that God the Father made to God the Son and God the Holy Spirit made to God the Father. I can rest in that because I know that God did it and he did it right. And the Lord Jesus Christ finished the work, didn't he? Look at the next verse. And he spake in a certain place on the seventh day on this wise and God did rest the seventh day from all his works, and in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. They didn't believe God. They didn't trust Christ. They, they, they were trying to atone for their own sins, establish their own righteousness. They weren't satisfied. They weren't like that weaned child. That was a baby. They thought, well, we can figure this out. We can do this. Again, he limited a certain day, saying to David, say it in David, today after so long a time, as it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Who has understanding And who hears the word of God? The weaned child, weaned from its mother's breast, who's satisfied with Christ and resting in the person and finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just resting in him. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterwards have spoken of another day? Now he's saying that the the rest that they received when they entered into the promised land was just a shadow of the real rest, the spiritual rest. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. <laughs> ceased from what? What is that baby doing? The Lord's likening us to a weaned child lying on its mother's breast. What's he doing? Is he working? No. There was before he, before he got full, he was crying, wasn't he? That's how the mother knew he was hungry. And the baby was crying. But now he's not crying. Now he's full. Now he's satisfied. And now he's resting. Resting. Resting in Christ. Go back with me. Cease from your labors, even as God ceased from his. The Sabbath, the seventh day, the day of rest, 
God rested because he was finished. Christ is our Sabbath. And the rest that we have is a spiritual rest. And men who try, I say this not for the benefit of anybody here, because I know you're not deceived by this. But there's people that listen to these messages that might be, might be helped by this. Those who try to keep Sunday as the Sabbath day are violating the very rest that Christ came to bring us. They're adding to the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're believing there's something they can do on Sunday. If you're going to be a Sabbatarian, become a Seventh-day Adventist. They're the best Sabbatarians that there are in the world. They are. They are loyal to the Sabbath, the seventh day, Saturday. And they're very legalistic about it. But don't pretend to be a believer. Don't pretend to be a believer. Don't pretend to be resting in Christ and practicing some sort of Sabbath laws and rules and regulations established by man. It's not, they're not consistent. They're contradictory. All right, let's go back to our text. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand the hearing? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Turn with me to Psalm 131. Psalm 131. Here's, a, here's another declaration of the same thing we just read. Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor mine eyes lofty. We've been there, haven't we? The proud, self-righteous, Calvinist, who prides himself in his knowledge and tries to intimidate his peers with his with with his doctrine and what's the he's not like a child lord my heart is not haughty nor mine eyes lofty neither do i exercise myself in great matters and things too high for me oh let them talk about their theological hair splitting all they want. They're discussing something they don't understand. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. Is that your soul? You stand before God as a dependent infant. You've, you, you've, you've drank from the milk of his word. You're full, you're satisfied, and you can rest right there on his breast. Let Israel hope in the Lord from henceforth and forever. I just stay right there. <laughs> I don't want to go back to that vomiting table, do you? I don't want to contend with the self-righteous and the religious anymore. I don't want to go back to a man-centered free will religion. I just want to I just want to be with Christ. I want to be with Christ and I want to know him. I want to know him. Precept upon precept. Line upon line, little by little, I want him to reveal himself to me. Now, I want to close with Hebrews chapter 6. Because I believe the Lord has taught me something from this passage. We'll, we'll close with Hebrews 6 and Ephesians 4. Now, the Lord is, is um, 
talking about the difference between knowing about Christ and knowing Christ. He's talking about the difference between having some doctrine and having Christ. And in chapter chapter 6, he says, Therefore, verse 1, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. And I place emphasis on that word doctrine. Doctrine's important but you can have doctrine and not have christ and uh he's talking about those who have to be persuaded over and over again on the abcs of the gospel in terms of doctrine and he says let us move beyond just having to be persuaded again and again about the foundations of the gospel, let us go on to perfection. Now, what is it to go on to perfection? Doctrine reveals Christ. Christ is the perfection. Christ is the perfection. All these doctrines, the doctrine of, the, uh, of repentance from dead works, that's total depravity. That's what that is, total depravity. And I know that all my works are filthy rags before God, all my righteousness. I, I, okay, so we have, to, we have to keep emphasizing that doctrine? No, that doctrine points us to Christ. He's the one who is all my righteousness. Yes, it's, it's, it's important for me to be reminded that my righteousnesses are as filthy rags, but I'm moving beyond the doctrine to perfection. Christ is my perfection. He is my righteousness. He is my hope. I'm satisfied with Him. I've been taught of Him. I'm leaning upon Him. I'm in the yoke with Him. Right, Matthew, we didn't get to that passage in Matthew chapter 11. I take my yoke upon you and learn of me. My yoke is my burden is light. My yoke is easy. Um, I'll give you rest for your souls. That, that, that's, you see, we're, we're moving beyond doctrine to that which is perfect. Christ is that which is perfect. Faith toward God. We're... We're we're moving beyond just the doctrine of election. Faith toward God. And we're and we're we're looking to the to the God who is sovereign and the one who has chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world. The doctrine of baptisms, that's union with Christ. That's the atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk a new life in Christ Jesus. The laying on of hands, that's imputation. Remember the priest in the Old Testament put his hands on the scapegoat and transfer the sins that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's the, but let us move beyond just just debating and discussing doctrine and let us move on to perfection and realize that these doctrines reveal Christ. He's the one that God placed his hands on, on Calvary's cross. He's the one who God made to be sin for us. God, lay your hand on me. Charge to me. The righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And give me the grace to lay hold of him. To find him to be my perfection. We're not just, we're not just preaching and debating. That's why Paul said, I profess to know nothing among you save Christ and him crucified. I'm, we're preaching the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, now turn with me to, Hebrew, to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. 
You know, those doctrines spoken of, spoken of there in Hebrews chapter 6, the resurrection of the dead, that's perseverance. You know, we're, we're, we know that this mortal is going to be in the, in the eternal judgment. That's, that's the accomplished work of the Lord Jesus Christ who has, who has established his people in glory with his own presence. Look at uh, Ephesians chapter 4. And he gave to the church, verse 11, some apostles and some prophets. Now the apostles and prophets were the men that God used to pen this book, the word of God. And some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Those are the men that God raises up to take what the apostles and prophets wrote. And preach Christ. For the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. And of the knowledge of the Son of God. Unto a perfect man. Unto the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ. So, Isaiah chapter 28, the Lord teaches his children, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, about the Lord Jesus Christ. And they know that they've been taught of God. Because every other religion of this world is a banquet of vomiting drunkards. And they're They they don't want any part of it. They're satisfied with the milk that comes from Christ. And they move on. Hebrews chapter 5 talks about the milk and meat. And and they they want to move on to 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 the fullness, the full stature of Christ. I want to know Christ. I want to know I'm satisfied with him. I'm resting in him. I want to know him more. I want to know him better. Or just keep taking your word, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, and reveal more of Christ to me until we come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're, we're so hopeful that you would be pleased now to attend what we've heard with the power of your Spirit. Give us ears to hear the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Give us faith to follow after him. For it's in his name we ask it. Amen. 434. 334. 334. Let's stand together. 334. Be thou.
Thou and Thou only, first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure Thou art. High King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun.